Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Common Sense Academy. I am your host, Joe Pometto, Joe the lawyer, uh, an attorney out of Pittsburgh, PA. This is a random event, uh, me deciding to go live. I'm going to go for about an hour today, talk about any topics, any legal topics that you would like to discuss, um, see how many I can get on a random Thursday night here in the chat room. As you can see, I got my yellow... Uh, Penguins t-shirt on for the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're playing in a hockey game right now. Um, and also, it, it it the color matches my sign. Go yellow. Uh, hello, Dragon Rose. Hello, um, Don. Um, thank you for joining. Hi. Miss me last. Hunter, I didn't go on last night, man. Thank you. I went on on uh, Tuesday. Hi, Autumn. Hello, Jeff. Thank you for joining me. I went on Tuesday. I didn't make last night. Um, I dropped a comment. So I'm trying to go live more often at my eight o'clock slot. So here I am. Hi, Ayase. Thank you for joining me at a live stream. That was not the same time, Sip. We'll do that later. I want to see. I'd like to get about uh, 20 people or so in the chat before uh, we do the same time, Sip. I had um, someone had asked me to tell stories about people falling asleep in the courtroom. I have two stories about people falling asleep in the courtroom that I will tell. Um, let's see. One is one involves a judge and one involves a lawyer, and they're both pretty comical. And then I actually have a story as well. Hey, Gary, how's that yoo-hoo? I also have a story as well um, about defendants defendants falling asleep, though that one's not as funny. That one's actually sort of, those ones are actually sort of sad. Um, I could tell some stories about the strangest courtroom I've ever been in. Um, heat it up, Hunter, heat it up. Um, we'll get about 15 minutes in and we'll do the same time sit. Okay, but I'm still... I just say, you know, you, you eat a big meal and, uh, you, you know, you're, uh, you're digesting and you get thirsty. That's what I am right now. <sighs> Go grab that adult beverage, Jeff. Um, I think, uh, you know, a beer. I feel like wine. I like Iron City Light. But I'm going to tell a story, and then I'm going to tell a story about uh, the funniest, the strangest courtroom. How about that? Strangest courtroom, Jefferson, Jefferson County, Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know. You guys know what they say about Pennsylvania? Is they say it's a uh, Philadelphia on the one side, Pittsburgh on the other, and Alabama in the middle. <laughs> And uh, there is some, there is, there is a lot of truth to that. Because if you drive through Central Pennsylvania, okay, you're gonna see, you're gonna see farms as far as the eye can see, farmland. Um, turkey burgers and you sounds good, sounds good. I went to an Italian restaurant tonight. I had chicken parmesan, some stuffed peppers. I ate a lot. I ate a lot of food tonight, but it was good. I'm drinking apple cider. Oh my god, it's it's freaking amazing. I like, can't stop drinking it. I cannot stop drinking it. Um, so I don't want to tell my stories just yet. Is there anything else uh, that people would want to talk about? Um, your brother-in-law makes vodka. Wow, really? That's pretty cool, Ms. V. I know a lot of people who make wine. I have several friends. Who make beer? I don't know. I don't have any friends who make vodka. That is impressive. Um, you know, with alcohol, I've got. I go through. You go through different phases in life. Uh, let me know if you got. If you think I'm on to something there. You know, when I was when I was real young, um, I didn't like drinking beer, so I would do mixed drinks and shots because. I needed, I, I couldn't just drink, I couldn't really drink beer and I couldn't really drink alcohol, right? I'm, and and I, I, <laughs> I started drinking in high school, okay? I drank, in, I drank a lot in high school. All right. So anyway, 
Um, I drank a lot of beer and, and or I'm sorry, mixed drinks, mixed drinks. And then I got into my 20s and I joined the Air Force and I learned to drink beer in the military um, because everyone drinks beer. I also think that your taste buds just change over time. Right. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Taste buds change over time. What the heck is going on? My TV. My TV just got weird. Oh, well, screw it. I had the Penguin game on. I had the hockey game on. Um, beer and, uh, in you know, my 20s and then I'm probably late 20s. I started drinking wine and beer. I do like wine. And then there was a point I had a, a stage real late 20s where I was drinking vodka. And that was my drink probably late 20s, early 30s was um, vodka and tonic or vodka. I actually preferred vodka and soda, just vodka, soda, and ice. Um, I still like it. Roman Cannon Law. <laughs> STGB has a new docket. No, stop. Roman Cannon Law. Beautiful. Be she's pulling out all the stops. She's pulling out all the stops. Want me to take a look at her docket? You guys want to look at the docket? Um, I can't see the filings. Okay. Uh, same here. I drank hard stuff in high school beer when you joined the Army. Now in my 50s, I, go I drink a goof bourbon and craft beers. Yeah, Jeff, I'm in the same, I'm in the same boat. So, and then, uh, and uh, so it was like, it was like liquor, hard stuff in high school. Then a beer phase in my 20s, and then back to like, then I started drinking vodka and I would drink martinis. I used to start my nights, I would drink a martini and then keep drinking, um, and then and then drink vodka sodas. Now I was in a vodka phase, and um, now I do, I love craft, I do like craft beers. I drink craft beers, I drink Iron City Light, that's like my standard light beer. You know, if I'm just like popping in a place, I'm going to have one or two and get out. Um, but I still like wine, I still like, I still drink wine. But I don't really drink vodka anymore. For whatever reason, I don't drink that much hard liquor. But yeah, a bourbon or a scotch, neat, on the rocks uh, is pretty good once in a while. Like if I go to a place that has um, some really good stuff. Let's see. Let's check out her docket. Let me see her docket, and then I will see... Okay, if I can predict the final outcome of her case. All right. Um, does anybody know what her docket, what her name is under the docket? Sharon Bay. Because I know she's in Pennsylvania and I can look it up. Sharon. I had looked it up before. Can't find it. Da, 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 da. Is it still at the Magist? Vigo just posted her docket. Virgo just posted her docket changes. Check Virgo. Okay, hang on one second here. I just want to see what her actual Sharon. Does anybody know the name that her docket is under? Because that's all I need in Pennsylvania. But I have to get it exactly. Gail Bay. Sharon Gail. Let's try that. Sharon Tracy Gail. Can't find anything. Oh, I see why. Okay, Sharon. I was doing it wrong. Tracy Gale. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Got to put, wait, wait. We might be there. We might be there. Sharon. Maybe it's Sharon Tracy is the first. All right, Sharon Gale. Sharon Gale. Sharon 
Tracy Gale. Girl Gale Bay, Sharon Tracy Gale. Is Tracy Gale the last name? I looked it up before. I can't find it. Okay, screw it. Um, or I'll, I'll check Virgo. Hold on. I gotta have Virgo on. We gotta do. A, we gotta do a live stream. Virgo. Da -da -na -na. No. Good afternoon, everyone. Na 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 na. There it is. She does have it up. Everybody. Sharon T. Gale. Okay, let's try that. Let's try that. Sharon T. Gale. Oh, excuse me. Sharon. T. Gale, everybody who's just hopping in. Uh, we're looking up the docket of Sharon Tracy Gale Bay. I still can't find it. I need the docket number. Let's see. She never puts the docket number up. Ah, here it is. She's got it. She got the link. Okay. Sharon T. Gale. Yeah, Virgo is Virgo is awesome. Okay, I got it, Bonsai. Thank you. Thank you, Bonsai. So she is charged. Wow. Okay, so she's charged with a felony three risking catastrophe. Three recklessly endangering another person, which us in the legal community call a REAP, R-E-A-P. It's that's called a REAP. Then she's got one, two, three felony charges of endangering welfare of child. We call that E-W-O-C. That's an E-Walk. And uh, one, two, three charges of conspiracy E-Walk, endangering welfare of children. Uh, one conspiracy risking catastrophe and three cons three conspiracy misdemeanor reads. Okay, so I have never I have never dealt with a risking catastrophe case. Okay, that's an extremely rare charge. It's interesting. Um, let's go down. Let's take a look at the docket. Case correspondence writes that. Okay, so she's just she's doing she's doing the the um the sovereign citizen thing here and paper terrorism spamming now she does have a court she has a standby court appointed attorney william davis who uh is trying to do the right thing and defend his client the assistant district attorney delaware county you know i actually i know i know some da's in the Delco, they call it Delco, Delaware County. I know some DAs in the Delco, Delco DA's office. Um, so, all right, affidavit. She fi filed an affidavit of fact, writ of discovery, affidavit of fact, notice of default judgment. That has zero meaning in a criminal in a criminal case. Hello, Vincent Arini. Um, then she filed abatement of jurisdiction, quo warranto, more fake documents. Um, but her her standby counsel, William Davis, um, he has Frank Richard Capelli, Richard Capelli, order appointing backup counsel. That happened in November. Um, Richard Capelli, order pretrial statements be filed by January 17th. Um, jury trial scheduled week of February 18th, 2020. Entry of appearance, Mark T. Chappelle. Uh, Capelli is filing Chappelle. Notice of Commonwealth to Moroccan Embassy. Consular action regarding Sharon Gale. Who is this Mark Chappelle? Who is this Mark Chappelle guy? He's, is he a fake lawyer filing things for her? He's going to get in trouble. Um 
And then she filed citing Roman canon law. Hello, Vincent. Thank you for joining me. Roman, Roman canon, canon law, general civil orders, rights that cannot be taken away. Um, the trial was supposed to start today, February 20th. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, it got moved to April. And um, she's going to have a jury trial. Oh, man. They're going to think she's crazy. Woo! For 2020. Her trial is scheduled for 4 2020. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Reading it now. She's a bill of attainder. She must have graduated to be a legislature. You're at, yeah, Jeff, that's a good point. Bills of attainder are are um, passed by legislatures. That's Yeah, good point. Good shot, man. Dave Chappelle's unfunny cousin. Yeah, Lou. Yeah. Sorry I'm late, but happy to catch you live. Thanks for coming in, Comfort Doll. Thank you. Okay, let me go get a refill, and I'm going to do uh, – we're going to do a same time sit for them. Kiss the Co. Farm. So here's the thing, uh, like apple cider, um, hilarious, Lou. Dave Chappelle's on Funny Cousin, yeah. Um, here's the, yeah, everybody knows the thing with apple cider is that it tastes really freaking good. When I get apple cider in my house, like it's gone in like two days, and I probably gain uh, three pounds just from straight sugar. Apple cider tastes great. Everybody, yes, hit like, please, thank you. Um, Hit like, go to my new channel, Joe the Lawyer. Um, and for those of you that are not on my email list, sign up for my email list. Go to any of my videos, sign up for my email list. I highlight the best videos of the week, and I send all kinds of free stuff. Hey, Chief Tuttle, thanks for joining us. We're about to do the same time sit. We were just going over Sharon Tracy Gale Bay's docket in which she filed a motion for canon law, a motion not to give up her rights, and a motion stating that I am ridiculously crazy. I'm sorry, she didn't actually file that motion, but that's an easy inference to draw from everything that she did file. So the thing about can the thing about apple cider is it tastes really freaking good, okay? Um, I'm here. I got this apple cider. It's from, uh, Kisico, Kisico farm in Apollo PA. Um, there's a lot of farms out in Apollo. It's about an hour away from Pittsburgh. Um, I've gone horse riding out there. If you got honey crisp cider, honey crisp cider, I'm going to write that down. Honey crisp cider. Um, but we're about to partake in the same time sip. So if you had to go and get your adult beverage, please grab it. Um, if you're here today and um, you're drinking Diet Pepsi, which is my normal normal drink, I praise you for that. Hello, Barbecue Bob. Uh, you may like water. You may like wine. Perhaps you have the ability to turn water into wine. In that case, um, you should be rich. And uh, you should come on my show. Regardless, um, grab whatever beverage you do have. Uh, maybe it's you who, like our best friend Gary. Um, maybe it's apple cider, like your good friend Joe. Um, maybe it's a beer, like uh, like Jeff went to get because he likes he likes he likes Miller Lite. Um, whatever it is, whatever beverage you like. Uh, raise it in the air. Um, I usually say cheers, salute, compai. Um, Nostrovia was thrown in just the other day um, because when you drink together, it tastes better. When you sip together, it tastes better. Everyone, cheers, same time sip. <sighs> Delicious. Delicious, delicious. Up your kilt, up your kilt. I love it. And coffee, of course, is the drink of the gods. I'm telling you, this freaking apple cider, I could drink that whole, I could drink the whole gallon 
in five minutes. I could drink the whole gallon in five minutes. This stuff is like crack, man. Mountain Dew. All right, John. <sighs> Cheers. John, some people, like I'm addicted to Diet Coke. Some people are addicted to Mountain Dew. It's crazy. I mean, I even know I've had friends who drink like two liter, like two, two liters of Mountain Dew in a day. It's unbelievable. Truly unbelievable. I'm not one to judge somebody, but man, I don't know if I, man, that's a lot of Mountain Dew. Woo! Woo! Mountain Dew is occupies a weird space in the world of soda. You know, I don't know why it's like carved out its own little niche. Like there are people who love Mountain Dew. And I think it's the same people who drink energy drinks. And the only reason I say that is because Mountain Dew is like a freaking energy drink. It's just got this weird bite to it. Um, that is, it's very unique. It's very unique. I got to give Mountain Dew credit. Um, what I do like, pass the lips over to Tongue Lookout Guy. Here it comes. All right. All right. I like it. All you need is cider, yeast, fairy gold temps to make apple jack liquor. Yeah, Mountain Dew seems to be addictive. Um, and people, I mean, people just love it. It's crazy. I like my favorite childhood beverage, and I'm sure many of you will back me up, was, is Cherokee Red Soda. Okay, uh, Cherokee Red Soda. And I know it's not politically correct, um, but it had the, you know, the Native American dude with the... Um, with the headdress on. I mean, it was just a cool symbol and um, really good soda too. <sighs> Cheer wine. Cherokee red, man. Look it up. I don't know if it, it, it's regional, like Western PA or the Northeast or the Midwest. Cheer wine. I've never had cheer wine. Um, but Cherokee red. Amen. Delicious stuff. So, uh, yeah, it looks like, yeah, Jolt's pretty good. Looks like Sharon Tracy Gale Bay is going to go to trial on April 20th. She's got standby counsel and some dude named Mark Chappelle working on her case who is not Mark T. Chappelle, who filed a notice to Commonwealth of the Moroccan Embassy. I mean, I can't even imagine what is going on in that courtroom. It's like a great... It's like a great meeting of the crazies. Mark T. Chappelle. Oh, no, I found him. Mark T. Chappelle, law offices, Lebanon, PA. Or Mark T. Chappelle is suspended on consent from the bar of the Commonwealth for a period of five years. He's a susp suspended attorney. Let's and now he's representing Sharon Tracy Gale Bay. Let's see what he did. <clears throat> Joint petition, blah blah blah. Specific factual admissions. Complainant was appointed as PCRA counsel. Respondent subsequently filed two applications, failed to file the brief, and the appeal was dismissed. Opened a file based on the information from court discovered that prior to entering a rehab, did not notify any current clients of his planned absence from his practice. He placed an outgoing message on his voicemail indicating that he was experiencing a medical emergency. Let me see here. Um, so he went into rehab and didn't tell any of his clients. In matter seven, Complainant alleged her husband and engaged respondent to handle their divorce. And neither party had been able to contact after contacting complainant's husband. Office of Disciplinary Counsel learned he had paid respondent $750 to handle the divorce, but had not heard anything from respondent since both parties signed the paperwork. Also informed that he heard that his file was being transferred, but had not heard. So this guy, this happens a lot. This Mark T. Chappelle, who's filing stuff on behalf of Sharon Tracy Gale Bay, I don't know if he's a, a, a an attorney, but he's like one of these, like a lot of lawyers uh, obviously <laughs> have drinking problems, okay, and and they'll go, like they'll get disciplined by the Office of Disciplinary Counsel and get their license suspended because of drinking, sometimes drugs. Um, but typically when that happens, like their practice falls apart, like they have all these clients and then they're drinking and they can't handle it and they stop calling and they just start taking money from them and not doing any legal services. It happens more than you would think. And that looks like that's what happened to this Mark guy. Now, I don't know. He may, he may have got his license back since then. 
because it looks like he's got a law office up. Um, but if she hired him, he's filing this crazy stuff. He's He might get suspended again. He might get suspended again. Suspended, updated, January. He just got his license back. Wow. He just got his license back. Lawyer was disciplined in 2000, updated January 25th, 2020. Boy, amen, amen. Sharon Tracy Gale Bay representing herself, noticing the cat, this the country of Morocco, and uh, and uh, noticing the country of Morocco, and at the same time, um, hiring lawyers that can no longer practice law. I'll share the link with everybody. You guys want to see the link? Um, whoops. Okay. Here's the link. It happens to a lot of attorneys, man. It happens to very sad. Well, I guess you didn't want to keep his license for very long. Did he Right. I think drug testing should be outlawed. And you cannot say a normal person and you stand out like you wouldn't believe. Well, that's true. I mean, they're not, they're usually not that hard to spot. They're usually not that hard to spot. Um, Okay, so let me tell a couple stories. I had somebody, I can't remember who it was, who asked me to tell stories. Oh, it was Panda, Ilularoba Panda, um, who is not functioning addicts, should be cut a break. Well, I'll tell you what, John, they generally are as long as they don't screw shit up. Um, Google, it shows where she filed in some non-existent tribal court magic. Yeah, I did. I just, I, I posted the docket up there if you guys want to take a look. Okay. Sleeping in court. So let me, um, my first year as a law student, you know, most people, if people are going to go to law school, I suggest that they get some exposure to the legal field before they go. I didn't really do that. FYI. So, um, thanks Lynn. So, um, first year, first year of law school, I do my, you do, I did my first, Actually, I did both semesters, and over the summer, I did my first clerkships, okay? And it was my first real exposure to legal practice um, because the first year of law school, you're just like, see this book here? I mean, think about it. Like, how much time would it does it take to read this? I read this entire book, and not only do we read these freaking massive books, like, we have to read them and take notes on them. OK, I mean, that's that's what that's law school. OK, that's law school. So first year of law school, I'm reading your your nose is in a book constantly. And so you're not exposed to the legal field or actual legal practice. You just have to learn the law. OK, so um, so my after my first year of law school, I got a clerkship. Yeah, my it was my first year. First year between first year, I clerked at a law firm, a, a small private law practice, uh, a judge, and at the public defender's office. Okay, no, no, no. Public defender's office was in between second year. God, time flies, man. So my first year, I was at this a small, mid-sized uh, civil practice firm, and and. Uh, I, I clerked for a judge and this judge, um, I don't know how old he actually was. Okay. But he was certainly in his sixties, perhaps his late sixties, early seventies. Okay. And he was a really, really nice man. And I remember going into his office and, you know, this tell you, tell you a little bit about judges Everybody says that judges have cushy jobs. Yeah, they do. They do. Some of them don't. I'll tell you, like, if you're a judge in criminal court, like, you're working your ass off, and even family court. But if you get into a civil court and you find a little niche, like this judge did, he did, like, special real estate. He was, like, a specialty court judge because he had been on the bench for so long. And he'd go, he went on a lot, he went on a lot of vacations. So I would go into his office and he had fo uh, the photos on each side of his walls were like 
all from cr different crazy parts of the world. And this, he had some like these photos from Africa. They were really cool where he's, he's like, there's lions and shit. Okay. So this judge, um, very, very nice man. I'd come in every day. We'd come in and talk about baseball for a half hour before anything else. And I live in the city of Pittsburgh. You all know, or maybe you don't, but if you follow baseball at all, you know the Pirates are one of the worst franchises in baseball, and they were bad at this time. So come in every day and watch baseball. So this judge, we'd sit in and I'd watch him do like motions, which is just the attorneys come in and argue. You know, the clients, the parties involved aren't there. Just the attorneys come in and argue. Watch him do motions. And then we'd go back in his office and he'd give us assignments and we'd do research and we would help him draft opinions. Okay. So finally, one day I came in, he's like, we're going to do a trial. So I was going to get to watch my first um, trial. The Rockies, yeah, you guys are better than the Pirates. So I was going to watch my first my first trial I've ever watched, okay? And, you know, most a lot of people going into law school or getting a legal profession or don't have exposure to it. They think the practice of law is like what you see in Law and Order or A Time to Kill or To Kill a Mockingbird, a courtroom full of 100 people and a, and a jury of distinguished, you know, citizens and, and the bailiff and everything. Okay, 90% of trials aren't like that. I'm in there that day. We're watching a non-jury trial, all right? And it was basically these two part, two people who owned real estate properties, and they were arguing over boundary lines. Okay, this was a trial, an argument over boundary lines. Okay, uh, the only people in the courtroom are <laughs> the only people in the courtroom are the judge who's sitting up on you know the judge's stand, whatever you call it, uh, you know, way up high, and uh, the two attorneys are sitting at counsel's table, and there were like their clients were there, and like one or two witnesses. And then a row of law clerks, okay, sitting in the back, you know, we're all like late 20 somethings. I was early 30 something, late 20 something um, law student nerds, you know, sitting in the back, all four of us together watching the, this trial. Ooh, okay. It was the most boring thing I have ever seen. And it was basically these, oh no, the Astros. Jeff, I want to interview you. I want to interview you. Anyway, um, so I'm watching this trial. It's one of the most boring things I've ever seen, okay? And it's not anybody's fault. It was just a boring topic. And I remember watching, and and it was kind of hilarious because these these lawyers got mad, and it's, sometimes it happens. Your emotions run high. It, no matter what the case is, if you're involved in a case, your emotions run high. So these lawyers are arguing with each other and uh over like the tiniest things all right and they kept going back and forth and we're about a half hour into the trial and I'm looking up and remember my buddies are sitting next to me it was two guys and we had one there was one female um so and I'm looking up at the judge and I notice that the that the judge has not moved okay the judge has not moved and he's sit again, he's an older guy and we're looking and uh, he's sitting up there on the bench and it was, and he had like, he was kind of like slumped over, like actually might've been like that, might've been like this. Okay. And he's like sort of slumped over. Okay. And he was in a position, he was in a position where you couldn't tell, you couldn't tell if his eyes were open or if he was like looking down at his pen and pad and pad. Okay. <laughs> and what gave it away, what gave it away is that he sat there like that, looking down or sleeping or sleeping for at least a solid 25 minutes. Okay. Of this one witness going into I'm telling you some of the most boring testimony you've ever, oh, I, well, I bought this property back in uh, 1976. And, and did you have a survey at the time? Yes, we had a survey. And you know, I'm putting this document in front of you. And uh, 
And, uh, oh, okay, what's this? Okay, the, some of the most boring, the history of a piece of land. It was so boring. And it was so boring that I'm pretty sure my judge uh, slept through at least 50% of it. And, and the reason I know that he was sleeping is because his technique, <laughs> okay, his technique was so good, <laughs> there's no way... <laughs> That he hadn't done it before. Okay. <laughs> so um I gotta give that guy Gary. Yeah, I bet. I bet. This was not the KC, the KC Anthony trial. That is what that's that's what Pete, that's what they depict in the movies. Okay. Oh, there's all these people in here. Like, so that's a high energy room. So many people around, like everybody has energy. This was not, okay. This was a Tuesday morning um, with two attorneys arguing over property lines, okay, and a judge that wanted, all he was really thinking about was his next trip um, to, you know, an exotic island in Asia and, you know, whether the pirates were going to ever win a game again. <laughs> so. Um, master technique, master technique. So that's my one story. That judge will remain unnamed. Um, <laughs> cause he's still out there. Okay. And I really like him now. I don't think he remembers me. That's the other thing. He doesn't remember anybody's name. Um, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeff, I didn't die. And I don't know what the result of the trial was actually, cause they didn't finish it that day. Oh, okay. So here's my second, here's my second sleep story. So this involves another, another older gentleman. Okay. And it's so funny, like practicing law, I'm it's a pain in the ass, but it's a lot of fun too. And kind of hilarious. So, uh, there's this one lawyer, there's this one lawyer who is He's he's old. Okay. Again, he's old and he's been around forever. I would say he's gotta be again, just like this judge, late 60s at this point, early 70s, but he may even be older. That's like they might might be late 70s. So this attorney, and I interned in his office. And so as a net law intern, you can't actually practice law. You actually, when you become a certified legal intern after two years of legal education, you actually can go and make arguments as long as an attorney is supervising you. Man, I got all this gas, I this giant dinner. So you can make, um, you can make, uh, you can, I'm sorry. So as a law, as a law student, you can, you can't really do anything in court. So you just have to follow lawyers around at court. All right. And watch what they do. And that's how you learn. And some of them will actually coach you, the good ones. Um, but a lot of them will not. Like uh, lawyers can just be total jag offs, man. You got, and you all know that. I mean, I don't have to say the most of the stereotypes are true. All right. Um, not for every attorney, but for a lot of them. Some of them are just total jag offs. Like I would follow them and they wouldn't even say a, a freaking thing to me. And I'm like, I'm like, what's wrong with you? It's like, I, I like to, I like sharing my knowledge. So if somebody asks me something like I, I share openly, I'm not one of those greedy people that hoard knowledge. So anyway, this attorney wasn't bad. He was just old, but I'm just trying to give set the stage is that what we do in law school is like, we just follow lawyers around. So one day I'm, um, I follow this attorney. Um, and he was an older gentleman and, uh, I'm going to, I am going to throw this out there. Okay. This older, this is another stereotype. Like this is an older gentleman and like, he's not like, he's not in, I'll tell this is another reason I didn't mind working at this office. Like he's not a me too type of guy. Okay. Like that. But he always hired very attractive women. <laughs> okay. And he just like, like that office was like 60 plus percent attract, like very, very attractive women. All right. So I interned there and, uh, 
And we go and we're, and I'm going to watch him do it, present a motion. Okay. And so there's a prosecutor on one side and then he was on the other side. Now he wasn't presenting the motions. One of his attractive young female proteges was presenting the motion. So, um, I was following them that day and I was sitting back in the, the, the seats in the back, the gallery, I guess. And they were up at council table, you know, past the bar, past the bar that the, the sovereigns believe if you cross into, you give the court magic jurisdiction. All right. And this is actually this courtroom, which maybe sets the scene a little bit more, is uh, an old courtroom and its original um, everything in it like the chandelier, everything has been uh, preserved to keep the original feel. It's like a historical room, okay, in the Allegheny County Courthouse, which is actually a beautiful building. And this um, this courtroom's been used in movies. There was a movie that Russell Crowe did where um, it, it was all shot in Pittsburgh. This was the courtroom that they used. Like he went to jail on like some bullshit and he was in jail and like he breaks out of the jail and they used the pit, the jail in Pittsburgh, the Allegheny County jail. Cause it's a, it's not a newer jail, but it's only like, it's only about 30 years old. So um, anyway, we're in this very uh, regal and majestic courtroom. If that majestic's not the best word, but it gets my point across. And this guy, this this very older seasoned attorney is sitting next to this young first year, very attractive female attorney, the district attorney prosecutor over on the other side. I don't remember who that was some empty suit. And, uh, the judge was a female, very, uh, well-respected long tenured female judge. Okay. Um, who really kind of ruled the courthouse in a way. Any, anyway, regardless, um, the female, the young female lawyer is up there and is making an argument. Okay. And it was a pretty intense case, like felonies, sexual assault type stuff. Okay. So they are, um, there's a lot of back and forth and the judge is asking a lot of questions, pretty intense argument. And I look over and the, the older attorney who's like 70 years old, like I said, 70 years old. Okay. Is litter is now this was not like, this was not like the judge where I, you really couldn't tell this guy was basically basic but it was it was actually similar he's sitting he's sitting like this like this okay and he's like a, a larger man okay and he's sitting like this and he's sitting like this okay just like that judge like that okay during pretty much the entire argument and what happens is this the judge knows that this lawyer arguing the case is like a first year lawyer and she's not like, she's struggling. She just doesn't know the law and everything as well. And so the judge out of nowhere, and I think the judge was trying to catch him to sleep and she goes, Mr. So-and-so, uh, why don't you answer this question that, you know, your young attorney doesn't, doesn't have the answer to. Okay. And like, um, and like out of the movie, like you go, you've all seen Michael Jackson thriller, right? Like you get the zombies and they're like, okay. He was like, <laughs> I don't know if I can reenact this. Okay. He's like, he hears the voice and he like, and it's like, uh, like some, some, uh, magical power fills him and he rises up. Okay. And he <laughs> just, like he rises up instantly. Okay. And he addressed, like, nailed the judge's argument. Like, he rose up instantly. Like, he was a zombie, like, reincarnated in that moment. And he's like, and the judge's question was like, you know, what's the statute that, that gives you the authority to request the, the, the document that you want? And he rises up and he's like, and he's like, your, uh, uh, oh, uh, your honor, um, that's statute 1543-72, uh, chapter and code 26-1943, and we should have this document um, because it's crucial to our case. Like, spits off the greatest argument ever, okay? And the judge is like, well, okay, all right, and she buys it, and, like, the prosecutor's silent, and 
as soon and so she goes back and starts like going back. To, she, so she goes back to the prosecutor, starts babbling, babbling it. Okay, and he, you know, he was standing up and he sits back down. Okay, and, and he goes right back into sleep mode. And like, <laughs> like it was like the strangest thing ever. It was like a shark laying in wait. He's like a robot, and he went back into sleep mode. Okay. And uh, so he, the funny part is that it looked like he was sleeping or he was out, but he was, he heard every single word. So I don't think he actually was sleeping. Okay. I don't think exactly. He was sharking, Jeff. He was sharking. And um, me and the other attorneys would talk about this because he was not the, that was not the first time that he did it. Um and here's the key. Here's the key to this is age and experience. Okay. Because I, there is no way in hell I could pull something like that in the courtroom. All right. I could not do it. A younger attorney um, could not do it. Uh, but some of these lawyers are, you know, it's, and it's funny to see because it'll, it'll be me someday, I guess. You know, they're older. Hey, Taze, thank you for joining. Thanks for coming in. They're older than the judges. And frankly, some of the, a lot of these lawyers, they know more about the law than the judge does. Okay. That happens. I mean, that's the kind of lawyer, man. That's the kind of lawyer you want. Like the lawyer knows every, <coughs> everything, but there's a downside to that is number one, the lawyers who, who think they know everything or think they've seen it all are also the same. are also usually the same lawyers who will not prepare for someone's case one bit. And they'll walk into a trial thinking that they can knock it out because they are Mr. Big shit. Now this guy that I'm talking about, he wasn't like that. Like he was actually, um, he was old and he knew the law, but he cared. He cared very much. He cared very much about his job. Um, but you know, you have these attorneys who think they know everything. They do. They know a lot. And they've been around. They've seen it all. And they've done crazy stuff. Okay, uh, but that overconfidence um, can damage them. Overconfidence can damage them. Uh, so I've seen that too. But uh, this guy, we always use. I used to always say. I said. Um, Right. They don't even prepare. They don't even prepare their own case, chief. Um, but these like we would always say about that one lawyer, like, is he sleeping or is he sharking? And the way that he, you know, we like we'd call him a zombie or like he was animated like Frankenstein. Like it was the funniest thing, man. When I saw that, it was so funny. Yeah, Megan, you're exactly right. You think you've seen it all. And then the next day you walk into court and it's something new or something crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so th those are my two sleeping in court stories. Now, the other sleeping in court stories that I've seen many times go like this. Um, person addicted to drugs comes to court high on drugs, even though their lawyer told them not to. Uh, said drugs are um, said drugs are opiates, often heroin, oxycontin, fentanyl, even though they probably don't even know it. okay? So they come to court and they're high as a kite. And they go and they, and basically, I mean, most court appearances, when you have a lawyer as a defendant are very easy. Okay. You literally will not have to do anything. Like I do everything for you, but you do have to show up. I mean, not a trial at a trial. You need to look presentable, blah, blah, blah. But most court appearances are routine appearances. Okay, you just show up. I do all the talking. You sign papers and you leave. Okay, so um, so under courts now of the bailiffs carry Narcan. They probably do, Jeff. You know what? I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. So these people come in high on opiates and they sit in the back of the court and all they needed to do was sit there and not look high. 
Okay. And they would be walking out in half an hour, an hour at less, but no, they fall asleep in court and fall, technically falling asleep is not the right word. The right word is, you guys know what it is, what these people do, what they call it, et cetera, et cetera. They, see if anybody can come up with it. I'm going to get a drink. I'll be right back. Yep, you nailed it, Cameron, Bob. They nod off. They nod. So they're in there nodding. And some judges, I don't know, like some judges, if it's their age or whatever, um, some judges I don't think know, understand it. I, honestly, like they're too old or something. I'm not sure. But some judge, like if I was a judge, and I was sitting up there, I would know, I would know 90% of the people that are in there and that are high. Like you do not want to do that. Like I've seen it enough and I've seen the different levels and I know all the signs. Okay. If you came into my courtroom high on heroin, like you're done, I would know. Anyway, they nod off and some of the, there's only a few judges really. I think some of the judges, they don't want to deal with it. So they just like they just pretend they don't notice. I think that happens, but there's no way for me to know for sure. Right. I can't read their minds, but I, sometimes I'm thinking like, how do you not like they treat that their case like every other case, but I can pick them out. I, not everybody can. Okay. Not everybody thinks about it, I, but I can pick them out. I know I can. So, um, some judges will, if they see you nodding off, only a few, but again, some of them, they see you not, hey, you, what's your name? What's your name, sir? Come up here. Come up here. Come up here. Bum, 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 bum. What's wrong? Why are you sleeping in the courtroom? Are you on drugs? Are you on drugs? What if I gave you a drug test right now? What if, oh, well, 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 well I smoked some weed last night. Bailiff, take him, bang, uh, take him, and, uh, Take them, um, bailiff, take them, um, give them a drug test. Take them downstairs, boom. They come up, hot pee, uh, blonde revoked, boom, go to jail. Like, I've seen that too. So those are, Panda, I told, you're going to have to go back and watch. I don't know when you join the stream, but I just told my favorite falling asleep in court stories. Um, so you're going to have to rewind a little bit if you want to hear them. I saw Narcan used in a library once. They also put an AED on the guy. The entire library can hear what's going on. I bet. I mean, Jesus. Is anyone familiar with an auditor named Nomad? He nodded out on his own live stream. <laughs> like, what is, like an auditor who's also like addicted to opiates? Like, come on, man. Come on. Alan Moser handled my bankruptcy quite a few years ago, and I had to do absolutely nothing when I went into the court other than answering a, a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, if you hire an attorney, you literally just have to show up for a lot of cases. Like I get people on, I'll tell you, I mean, if you hire me on a DUI, you won't, you never, you won't even have to talk about it. Okay. You may never even have to talk about it. You just have to show up. Okay. So, um, Devin Bay the Moore has done that. I mean, you know, these people like you're a heroin addict and an auditor or something. Like you're a heroin addict and a sovereign citizen. I mean, come on. Come on. It's better not to talk at all. Well, the, Hunter Lee, you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. And that's why people who go in without lawyers are dumb because they just spout off things that they don't even need to say ends up getting them in trouble. I'm not a fan of cops, but I don't really mind them when they are dealing with auditors. <laughs> I mean, you know, you got to you gotta bless the police for some of the stuff that they have to deal with, man. It's unbelievable. It really is. Um, so, uh, Panda, 
you I I I I lu Ilurapoda Iluropoda Panda. Iluropoda Panda. I told your stories. Joe, why do softards believe the codes are not laws and how can they think that? Um I myself am a big fan. I don't judge them all by the few bad ones that are out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, why do sovereigns believe the codes are not laws and how can they think that? Um, now, Cameron, I haven't seen, I mean, here's the thing. Codes, codes are laws like anything like codes are, you know, the, a code is generally going to be a law. There are some codes that may not be laws, like like uh, you could have municipal codes um, or set, et cetera, et cetera. But for the most part, they're going to be laws. Um, you know, for something to be a law, it basically just needs to meet the constitutional requirements, which are um, anything that, that is basically put into writing and is... Um, follows the legislative process, is approved um, by both chambers of commerce and whoever the chief executive is, whether it's a state, um, a city, or the country itself. At that point, it becomes a law. Whether you refer to it as a code or a law, as honestly, is irrelevant. Okay, uh, Referring to something as a code or a law, it's just a way to reference. A code is just a reference source. It's a, it's a, it's a sorting system. <laughs> It's a library code. It's a, it's a, um, <clears throat> you know, bibliography. It's just a, it's just a way to keep track. Um, you know, sovereigns. So I don't know if they, if, if I haven't heard that one from sovereigns that codes are not laws. Um, but I, I mean, I know that they generally don't accept any laws and they believe that no laws are actually law. And that's based on, you know, set multiple theories, one being that, um, you know, the Articles of Confederation were actually what established this country. And the United States Constitution is is a fake document that overrode the true rights of the state. I mean, that's one theory that they go by. Some of them say the Declaration of Independence is in effect, but the, the Constitution is not. And then some of them say that the Constitution was overridden or and or changed with the passing of the 14th Amendment um, post-Reconstruction. So I haven't heard the codes are not laws argument. I can tell you, though, that a code is, uh, is codes are simply a sorting mechanism to, to keep track of and find the laws. Yeah, a statute. Here's actually. So, I mean, here's a good discussion to have is what is the what is the common law? So. Um, you know, American law is a product of British law and British law, or maybe more specifically, English law is a product of a thousand years, right? And, you know, back in 1066, <laughs> William the Conqueror uh, came over from Normandy, France, and conquered Britain, right? That's actually the birth of the English common law tradition. Um, because you'll see in English law, there's basically three languages. There are three languages in English and United States law. Of course, there is English. What most people don't know is that there is a, a very large French influence on English law, which comes from the Norman conquest of England, and Latin, which uh, obviously comes from, you know, the Roman Empire, Latin influence on the continental Europe as a whole. So um, that tradition of law, early England law, early English law, laws, and this could, you could go back to like the Roman Republic, but law, like laws were not always written down. Um, first of all, so then what happened, what happened in the common law, when we get closer to like, I guess the Renaissance type period, um, 
what you have is judges would make decisions and then that would become the law. Okay. And so that was how the law was meted out in feudalistic England. Um, later on, when England becomes more centralized, the kings and the parliament begin to pass statutes, right? A statute is like kind of like a law with a more specific purpose. Um, the common law was just based on prior decisions. So if you sat before a judge and uh, if you read about, if you really get into English history, um, which I've, I've dug into pretty deep early English history, believe it or not. Um, King Henry the second, uh, used to, and it was really cool. Like he would, he would travel around his kingdom, you know, in like a caravan and sit, you know, go to towns or large cities and just hear cases. Like he would go to these cities and hear cases because he was the ultimate law. And like they had local magistrates, right? But the king, you know, if the king drops by and you got, you got 20 cases on the docket that day, well, let's take it to the king because that, that the, the king's decision, obviously he's going to have more authority. Okay. And so what happened is, and that, you know, laws weren't written down. A judge would come down with a decision on a certain set of facts. And then that would become the law in regards to that set of facts. And, and, and future decisions were based on these prior decisions, which served as precedent. So the, and, and then once the English started to write these decisions down, you could actually look at the a legal opinion from one of these judges and you could pull out the rule. You could pull out the rule. Okay. And that rule, it has the force of law. It's judge made law. That is the common law tradition. So when we get in, when you got into modern, more modern times in England, even before the founding of the United States, parliament would pass statutes. Like once they had a functioning national parliament would pass statutes. And so what you had in England was a mixed system. Um, certain, like if, if certain issues didn't have statutes passed on them, then the common law controlled. And what the judges would do is the, the first thing in legal analysis, you say, well, are there any statutes? Are there any, and a statute is just a law that was passed by a legislature. Okay. And statutes, and the first thing you do in legal analysis, are there any statutes that regulate this particular issue? Well, no, there aren't. Okay, then what do we do? Well, then we go to the common law. Well, what have judges done in the past in this situation? Oh, well, the last 10 cases were decided this way. So that's the rule that we're going to apply to this case. And boom, that's how the common law has the force of law. Common law is judge made law. And in England, then and now, it existed side by side with statutory law. And it also, that is the current system that we have in the United States. Um, the interesting thing about, and the interesting thing about common law, like in earlier centuries, well, I'd even say decades in the United States, like, like criminal law used to be all common law. But there was a large movement in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s to put all of the criminal law into code. There are model criminal codes that lawyers put out, and then the states will pull them and use them. Okay, so, you know, 95 to 100% of your criminal law is now under a criminal code. And that's true of federal law and state law. Um yeah, absolutely, Jeff. It is absolutely in effect. Okay, now, now tort law, tort law, and tort is tort. I believe the definition of tort, tort is a French word, and a tort means basically a wrong committed on someone. Tort law, like personal injury, most personal injury cases come under a law that's called negligence. Negligence requires. Uh, requires um, duty, breach, 
causation and damages. I'll never forget that. Okay. That's drilled in in law school. Duty, breach, causation, and damages. There are these tort laws, many tort laws are not written in statutes. Okay. Negligence is nowhere. You are not going to find a negligence statute. It doesn't exist. It's in, in Pennsylvania. Negligence is, is controlled by the common law. Okay. So certain areas of law and certain issues are still controlled by the common law. Now, The common law also, and that is that is the common law tradition. It's a larger emphasis on judge-made law and precedent. And so, what you have, what you had in Europe in the 1700s, eight early 1800s, was a movement in continental Europe was a movement to put all the law into codes. Right, like the Napoleonic Code, the Napoleonic Code, blah blah blah. Okay, well, he did. You know, when he conquered like half of Europe, he put into place all these codes. Well, when the Europeans threw Napoleon out, um, they said, "Well, he set up a pretty good legal system," and so the French Napoleonic Code stayed. And you know, Germany is a uh, a more code statutory based legal system. France is a statutory based legal system. Italy is a statutory based legal system. Spain, um, most of Western Europe and continental Europe is statutory based legal system, code based, civil codes, more or less. Um, but England, Great Britain, and all the Commonwealth countries, so Great Britain, United States, Australia, um, you know, Scotland, even Scotland, Ireland. I don't know about Ireland. They always want to do different things, right? Um, they all, those countries still have the common law. I believe India uses common law because its legal system is, was based more or less established by the British when they ruled India. So um, that's the common law. Now, the thing is, is what happened over the decades is, you know, statutory law, even in the United States, encroached into most areas of common law. Um, so the majority of the laws in the majority of states are regulated by codes now, but there are still things like negligence and something like common law marriage that existed, but was never written into a code, but it, it got passed down by judges and precedents. And then it got rubber stamped by like, say the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Um, what common law marriage, at least in Pennsylvania was abolished about 10 to 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, that was a purely common law thing. Like it wasn't written into a statute. That's just what judges did. And then it became law because it got rubber stamped by the higher courts. Now, even code based systems rely on precedents, right? And obviously even code based code based systems still need judges because it's a, it's judges job to interpret the statute and then apply it to the facts. And sometimes a particular application of a statute um, is is articulated in an opinion, okay, and then that becomes the law. That becomes the meaning of the statute, right? Because statutes can be general, and then judges will write in the specifics or how they apply in specific situations, okay? And that's more of like precedential law, and that exists even in code-based um, countries, but that's sort of common law because it's the judges reading the laws, making the decision, writing opinions on what this particular statute should mean. And then if the higher courts, you know, agree with them, that, that opinion now has the force of law. It is a law. Um, Louisiana, interestingly enough, is the only state in the union that does not have a common law tradition. And I'm sure after the explanation I just gave, most of you can figure out why. I'd be interested to see that the reason dropped in the comments. Why does Louisiana not have use the common law? 
Does anybody know? That is the question. That's the $100 question of the day. I'm sorry. I'm not actually giving you $100. Um, but yeah, it's quiz time. Why, why, if you listened to all the nonsense that just came out of my mouth, <laughs> can you tell me why? Yep. Boom. Taze nailed it. Exactly. It's the French tradition in, um, in Louisiana. So I, Louisiana probably has, uh, does not apply negligence, like the negligence law that I just articulated to you, like the rest of the country. It's likely written out in a code. Um, but, you know, much, the, 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 the truth, in my opinion, the truth about common law is that it makes, it gives judges more power. OK, and it makes your legal system, again, in my opinion, a bit more flexible, because if a situation arises and it's not covered by a statute under like code based systems, they're going to have to go out of their way to sort of um, find statutes that apply to it. Uh, whereas, you know, with a common law tradition, there's just more flexibility and more power for judges um, to do what they want to do. So I actually really, I enjoy the common law. Louisiana is bought and paid for, but yeah, that's why they're called, they don't have counties. They're called parishes, et cetera, et cetera. Do they put people in jail for negligence or is that very regional? Negligence is a civil action. I Luro Poda Panda negligence is a civil action. Um, but there are certain crimes that, you can commit through negligence. Um, so depends on exactly what happened as a result of your negligence. Excuse me. It actually could be criminal. It could be. I lived with a chick in 1971 for six months. She tried to sue me for divorce. <laughs> she wanted your money, Juan. I believe that when it existed in Mich Michigan, you had to live together for 10 years, but I certainly could be wrong about that. I believe, Vincent, you know, in Pennsylvania, um, I think, because I remember hearing about it when I was growing up and it was in effect. By the time I started practicing law in 2013, it was gone. Um, and I, I think it only, I think it was only abolished in Pennsylvania in the 2000s. Um, but I could be wrong. It might've been, it might've been, yeah, I think maybe the early two thousands. Um, right. Comfort doll. Exactly. There's criminal negligence when it comes to children and the elderly. It depends on what results from your negligence, right? So negligence is kind of like when you do something wrong, but not intentionally, like something bad happened because you didn't do something. Um, and in a lot of circumstances, that's not going to be criminal, but there are situations where something where negligence could rise to criminal activity. Um, it's rare, but it exists. Most criminal statutes require, um, a, um, this is called, so every crime has a state of mind. I can episodes on this. So every crime has a state of mind. So some cr crimes like first degree murder, as you know, requires premeditation and intent. That's a very high standard. Like you wanted to kill this person and you thought about killing the person beforehand. Um, and then some statutes require recklessness, which means you just acted with com like, say you got, you got totally drunk and drove through a crowd of people. Okay. Maybe you didn't mean to kill anybody, but you did. And your action was so, um, so out of the bounds of normal human decency that it was reckless. Okay. And you can be convicted of a crime. So you could walk into court and say, well, I didn't mean to kill anybody, but, but you got drunk and drove through a crowd of people and you hit someone, they died. You would expect that result to happen. That's kind of like recklessness. And then you have, then you have knowing, knowingly, at least in Pennsylvania, and then you have negligence and negligence is something like most often it's in uh, a personal injury case where it, let's say for like, drive, like, let's say you're driving. Okay. And you run a red light and you hit another person. OK, or you hit another car. All right. Nobody's killed. You're not going to get charged with a crime. If you kill someone, you may get charged with a crime. Um, 
that's negligence. Or another example of negligence is common slip and falls. Let's say you run a business and there's a uh, a wooden stairway into the front door of your business and one of the stairs breaks and it's been broken for a year and you haven't fixed it. And uh, granny comes along, walks on that second step, it cracks, she falls backwards, all right, and, you know, breaks her hip. That's negligence. You knew it was there. You should have fixed it. Even if you didn't know, you should have known. Okay, that's negligence. But corpus delecti. You know, I spoke about corpus. Yeah, all right. Well, here's the thing, guys. I'm getting tired. Um, and it's getting a little bit late for me. I know a lot. See, a lot of the YouTubers, I no, I need something stronger. But if I drink coffee now, I'll be up until 4 a.m. I'm not kidding. Um you know, some YouTubers, they start like a lot of the live YouTubers start at like 11 and go till 3 a.m. And it's like, man, I, I would do that if I didn't have to get up at 6 a.m. every morning or earlier. Um, I will talk about the corpus delecti in the future. It's the body of the crime itself. OK, um, and it doesn't mean body. It means it means the, it doesn't mean body literally. All right. Um the only city where the teams use the same colors. Pittsburgh, PA, baby, black and gold all the way. Our bridges are gold. Um, yeah, you get the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Pittsburgh Penguins, black and gold all the way. I love it. I love it. I don't know if they're the only city, but they're one of the only cities. New York, New York, if you look at New York, well, the New York Jets are green. Um, but you got the New York Rangers, the New York Yankees, the New York Knicks. Um, what's what am I missing? Even the new well, the Mets, but the Rangers, um, the Rangers, the Yankees, the Knicks, and the and the Giants are all sort of like blue and white. Like New York City almost has like this whole just red, white, and blue, but mostly blue and white thing going on. Um, but most cities don't have this the color scheme like Pittsburgh does all around. Um, black and gold, black and gold all the way. Um, better get to work before I get written up. All right, Vincent, get to work. Not out in court. What could go wrong? Nothing. Just, you know, a couple of months in jail. Um Doesn't mean proof of a crime, basically. Yeah, you're right, Comfort Doll. You're actually correct. That's pretty close. Okay, everybody, have a great night. Thank you for joining me on the Simultaneous Sip. If you missed my stories, go back, watch it. I started at about 15 minutes and told two stories about sleeping in court if you want to watch those. Everybody, if you haven't, uh, please hop over and subscribe to my other channel. I don't put out as frequent of content, but that's going to change over there. And that's like the more real in-depth legal stuff. So check out Joe the Lawyer and sign up for my email list too. It's in the description of every one of my videos. Um, get in my email list, get on my other channel. I really appreciate it. Very, um, just a free, free, low labor way uh, to support the show. I'd be very, very thankful for it. Um, about the statement I made about my late wave, my late wife. Vince, I can't remember, man. Drop me, go to the Common Sense Academy Facebook page and drop me a comment in there. Drop, send me a message. Um, I can't remember what you're, what it, I missed it, Vince. Sometimes when I'm talking, I don't see all the comments. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Had a nice night. Uh, good night. Sleep well. I'll be back over the weekend.